uh, this three-part process of increased visual acuity, increased sexual activity, and then increased, uh, for want of a better word, religious activity. And in this religious activity, and this is very important, there was glossolalia. Glossolalia is um, language-like behavior uh, that goes on in a kind of trance-like state. And it's very dear to American fundamentalists of certain stripes. But it's a worldwide phenomenon. And many, many shamans uh, give performances of glossolalia. Glossolalia... When they do it? No, they call it... They say it's the spirit language. It's the language of the spirits. It's the language of the haruka. And uh, this... What it is, clearly, is a kind of uh, seizure and discharge of the neurological machinery. I mean, language is the most complicated thing we do. It is orders of magnitude more complicated, even if you're a structural engineer or a software writer. Well, if you're a software writer, you work in language. But language is the most complicated thing that we do. And it appears that it's in these primates, it was like the overflow of intentionality creates then a kind of cascade of verbal arrhythmia of some sort. And over a thousand generations or so, this becomes uh, integrated as a mode of activity. I mean, it is not easy to imagine how language emerged. I think the easiest way to imagine it is to think that it was done for people's amusement long before anybody used it for communication. That, in other words, the first musical instrument was the voice. And I doubt that they sang Verde arias, <laughs> you know. If any of you have heard Inuit throat music... What is it? Inuit throat music? What's Inuit? Inuit that? or Eskimos. Oh. Uh, all kinds of people all over the world experiment with glossolalia. Glossolalia is simply where you ape language in the absence of meaning. I mean, it's very easy to do. He de me huai huak si kipin polk fam batik ra hau kep mi si de ki jul gain. E to kom fuai huak si kipipin ef de mi nol kwat e kol bekt ak man kifidik. See, it's all there, except there's no meaning. But there is syntax. I mean, if you analyze this stuff, you discover there are connectors, there are declensions, there are prefixes, there are suffixes, but no meaning. Meaning came very late, I imagine, and probably part of what this had to do with was the explosion in brain size. I mean, who knows how much pathology was expressed. I don't think you can... expect an organ to triple in two million years without having a fair number of uh, duds come out of that. I mean, this organ was really evolving under pressure. Well, so then, uh, where all this climaxed then was in this partnership paradise. Once nomadism and the relationship to cattle and the relationship to the mushroom And the mushroom, you see, was perceived, I imagine, as female. This was definitely a female mindset, what was going on here. Probably the language pressure was heaviest on the females because the males, sharing a general primate characteristic of being more robust physically than the females... I mean, if you've ever seen baboons, they're the most grotesque case. I mean, the male baboon is three times the size of the female. I mean, he's just a hunk, you know, and she's a little creature skittering along beside him. Uh, In this partnership situation, all of these factors came together, and there was what was experienced, I think, as a kind of paradise, a kind of dynamic equilibrium. And... 
uh, so I think probably women were the keepers of the mysteries of language. The cattle were very central to all of this because the cattle were a new way of life, a much easier way of life. Instead of scavenging off lion kills, uh, which is what the previous hominids were doing, we actually formed this reciprocal relationship where blood, milk, and meat were available to the human beings, and in return they uh, propagated and increased the size and protected these herds. But a natural consequence of all this activity is for the mushroom to always be there, to always be present. And the earliest stratum of religion that we possess is this horned goddess image that is, you know, upper Paleolithic, high Neolithic, the great horned goddess. Well, she is uh, the goddess of the animals, the mushroom goddess, the, the mother image that was the religious icon stabilizing this society. Then the question becomes, well, if it was so wonderful, what went wrong? Well, the same forces that created it destroyed it, which was this progressive drying of the African continent. It's locked up in the mechanics of the solar system. It doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, fate and blame. And when the part, when the grasslands of, of the Sahara became sparser, the distance between water holes became greater, the mushroom cult, as I explained to you last night, became replaced with a mead cult. And as these people poured into the Middle East, was a much harsher climate. They had then to resort to uh, agriculture. Agriculture, which had been minimal and unfocused to that point, became absolutely necessary in the new regime of the retreating glaciers that were pulling back across Palestine and Lebanon. And uh, Jericho, which is an 7,000, 8,000-year-old site uh, on the West Bank, uh, was the most advanced civilization of its time. And what was it? It was a grain tower with a series of defensive enclosures around it. It indicates that agriculture had succeeded to the point that it had brought with it paranoia. Because if you succeed at agriculture, you produce surpluses. These surpluses mean you are a target for raiding by less fortunate people. So this kind of thing was going on. The evidence for all of this uh, are these rock paintings in southern Algeria on the Teseli Plateau where we actually see shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies and dancing. Uh, this has never been talked about by ordinary anthropologists or students of cultural uh, influences. I'm not sure why. I tend to think that there is a kind of unconscious racism in the suppression of the idea that the origin of not high culture but of humanness itself is in Africa. There's a great deal of stress placed on what's called Old Europe the Gravettian civilization of old Europe that flourished in Yugoslavia and the Balkans. But I think when you factor in the wetness, the rec until very recently, the wetness of Africa, uh, the argument can be made very strongly that you know perfected human society existed there and only there. And that uh, you know recapturing that is what this... Uh, it is really the task of reclaiming the world. If you look at Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, which is the story of our origin, you can see it in a whole different light. It's the story of a drug bust. It's the story of the suppression of information about plants. Analyze the story. It's a story about an uppity woman first of all, a woman who doesn't take orders from anybody. And she has a relationship um, with a, a snake. 
And the snake tells her that if she will eat of the fruit of a certain tree, uh, she will gain... uh, It's the fruit of the tree of life, I believe. Knowledge. Knowledge, The fruit of the tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So she does this. And she uh, gets her rather dull-witted consort to join her in this enterprise. (laughs) And then it says... And their eyes were opened, and they saw that they were naked. Now, the fact of the matter is, they were naked. So, opening their eyes and seeing that they were naked is one way of saying uh, they gained true information about the world. They were informed of their existential situation, which was that they were naked. Well, when God heard about this, the shit hit the fan. And there's a very, very interesting passage in Genesis in which Yahweh, musing to himself, as far as you can tell, in the garden says, you know, this was bad enough, but if they were to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, then they would become as we are. They would become as we are. And so this whole thing has to be shut down and these people have to be kicked out of here. And they are, he says, you know, you're going to labor and it's going to be a bad trip and I want you out of here. And then the final shot is an angel with a burning sword is placed at the eastern gate of Eden so that the human beings can never find their way back. What this is, is the story of... uh, the breakup of a woman-run psychedelic partnership society by aridity. The angel at the eastern gate of Eden is the, the unforgiving Saharan sun, making it impossible to go back. You see, um, and the switch from partnership to dominator society is... Uh, occasioned then by abandoning this set of practices which keep the ego under control. Now, let me make it clear. It isn't that uh, our general tendency is toward dominator organization. If we relax our vigilance against being assholes, the whole thing will slide toward the dominator model. The reason this is, is because the really primitive uh, primates, the proto-apes, the apes, they have very hierarchically structured societies with alpha males at the top and females very closely controlled by males and so forth. It was only this very brief period, no more than 50,000 years, where the use of a psychedelic plant made that impossible. And the reason it did that is this. Uh, If you analyze thousands and thousands of psychedelic experiences so that all the individual qualities of the experience are subsumed in the general form, and then you ask, what what is the psychedelic experience? What can we say about it that will be true of all 50,000 cases? The answer is, it dissolves boundaries. That's what this stuff does. Whatever your boundaries are, I mean, you may be a Hindu priest, a communist bureaucrat, a gay hairdresser in New York, it doesn't matter. It will totally challenge and overthrow (laughs) your view of reality because that's what it does. Boundaries are creations of culture. Remember the child lying underneath the spinning uh, things in its crib. William James, great psychologist of the turn of the century, said, we are born into a blooming, buzzing confusion. That's what we, which is a good description of a DMT trip, too. And we reside in that blooming, buzzing confusion 18 months, two years, until we get our language skills together. And then we begin to mosaic over the confusion (coughs) with concepts and we create culture. One of the great strides forward in the 20th century has been the general understanding on the part of the straight practitioners of the art that language creates reality. 
Reality is not made of quarks and mu mesons and all that crap that they're dishing up out of these high energy machines. That's a dance of language. What reality is made up of is language. Reality is made of words. And many, many realities can be made of words and they can be mutually exclusive realities. They do not necessarily map onto each other. The world of the Hopi medicine man and the world of the communist bureaucrat and the world of the Eskimo fisherman are, are almost mutually exclusive domains. I mean, they can only reach each other over bridges of very generalized concepts. So the world is made of language. When you take a psychedelic, that cultural world is dissolved. It's just psycholytically dissolved. You know, Aldous Huxley had the notion of what he called the reducing valve. He believed that following uh, C.D. Broad, that uh, our senses have evolved to only allow in the tiny stream of data that is necessary to animal existence. That all the rest of the electromagnetic radiation and data that is raining onto our eyes and our skin and our senses is shunted into the unconscious. But that when you take a psychedelic, the reducing valve is suddenly cranked open and here comes all of this stuff and it just washes away all assumptions that are cultural assumptions. It puts you, in other words, in contact with the nitty-gritty. It's about what is real, not what is culturally, uh, culturally sanctioned. So that kind of thing operating in this primitive African situation that we're talking about means probably something like that at every new and full moon these small groups of people got together and they all took mushrooms together and uh, there was group singing, group sex and strong visioning and the what the group sex did on one level was it, it further contributed to the problem of identifying paternity so that values tended to be group values, not my children and my women, but the children and the women. And uh, uh, you see, the ego lives by constraint. It draws lines. And this drawing of lines is a denial of the primary truth of the world, which is that it is seamless and one. Once you start drawing divisions, you're off into dualism. And it's no joke to say that dualism is the root of all evil. Uh, Once you start making these distinctions, if you believe in them, then you've really cut yourself off. So... uh, In the Middle East, about 9,000 years ago, out of nowhere come these people called Natufeans, Natufeans. And they have a much higher level of culture than any of the surrounding people. It's interesting, you know, we're told that the Nile is the cradle of civilization and so forth. Uh, But did you know that from 17,000 years ago, until 10,000 years ago, almost nobody lived in the Nile Valley. For some reason, it was not thought thought of as desirable. Probably it was a malarial lowland, and uh, the happening habitat was out on what is now the desert, what was then the grassland. So cultural remains in the Nile Valley before 10,000 years ago indicate very only uh, minor cultural stuff happening. 10,000 years ago, these new people appear out of nowhere called Natufeans. They live under the rock faces, the undercut rock faces. They paint these faces. They uh, live for a thousand years in that mode. Then they build Jericho. Uh, 
and they live there for a thousand years. Then by 8000 BC, they move up to Chatal Hyoyuk on the Anatolian plain. They are the most advanced people in the world. Now, it's always been assumed on zero evidence that these people must have a cultural connection to the Gravettian culture of old Europe. There is substantial physical evidence to link them with Africa. They At Chatal, they had a cult of the vulture, which is a quintessential animal of the African grassland. Uh, the so-called burnished Sudanese ware, a certain kind of pottery that we know where it came from in Africa. We find fragments of it in the middens at Jericho and at Chatal. So there is strong evidence that these were the people who had been practicing the partnership paradise model of life. Uh, around 6,500 BC, wheeled chariot people, probably part of the Kurgan wave phenomenon hypothesized by Maria Gambutas, come down from north of the Caspian Sea in the Zagros Mountains level 6 and 6b of Chatal is burned through. Uh, clearly, it uh, had been overwhelmed by invaders. Well, now, I don't know how many of you know about Chatal Hyoyuk, but this is, in some ways, the most interesting archaeological site on the planet because this is a 7,000-year-old town in Anatolia, 7,000 BC, which makes 9,000 BP. This is a civilization, aside from the monolithic architecture, this is a civilization as advanced as Egypt, you know, with glass, uh, with uh, a primitive astronomy, with a pharmacopoeia, with agriculture, with husbandry, with an advanced religion, uh, and it exists much, much older than if you grew up in my generation, you were taught history begins at Sumner. Well, Sumner was not even a twinkle in anybody's eye when Chateau Huyuk was a civilization of immense accomplishments and richness, eventually destroyed by these dominators. Then uh, it, that civilization went to Crete, and thrived in that environment for a very long time. Coming down into the time of, uh, of uh, ancient Greece, the Eleusinian mysteries are Cretan mysteries that have been transplanted to Greece. And that's really where the psychedelic religion died. It had been dying for thousands of of years. It never really flourished outside of Africa. But in the period when it was happening in Africa, it created in us an appetite bordering just below the level of a genetic proclivity for a boundary dissolution. And this is the key to understanding our fascination with addiction. You know, this guy Ron Siegel wrote this book about how animals love to get stoned. And so they do. I mean, uh, elephants like rotted papaya and so forth and so on. But human beings addict to about 60 compounds and are fascinated with maybe 40 more. This kind of chemical obsessionism is very hard to explain evolutionarily. It doesn't seem to make any sense unless you hypothesize a situation in the past in which this was very important to us. And when we moved out of Africa and broke this connection with nature, because that's what it really is, when you dissolve the boundaries of language, what, what floods back in to fill that vacuum is uh, the, f the fact of the natural world, you know, the overwhelming modality that we are placed in that is not culturally defined. Uh, so that, that kind of relationship to nature, having been disrupted, leaves us with uh, not only a sense of loss, but a, an, a kind of anger, 
a kind of fury directed against the natural world. And if you know the story of Gilgamesh, you know that uh, he spurned the goddess in Nana, and she sent uh, she sent a bull to convince him. And this is, and he destroyed the bull. And then he took his friend uh, Enkidu, the shaman guy, and against the will of Enkidu, they went out together and they chopped down the tree of life. This is what Gilgamesh was all about. So Gilgamesh is like a transitional figure. Gilgamesh rejects the goddess, destroys the cow, forces the shaman to go with him into the wilderness to cut down the tree of life. How much more explicit does the symbolism have to be? And of course, Gilgamesh is the paradigmatic dominator. He is almost the founder of the theory of dominator culture because he's a builder of cities, um, a, a general of armies, a master of uh, women, although of not of the goddess. Uh, the strange thing about Gilgamesh is his sexual ambivalence, his obvious discomfort in the presence of women is so much a part of that myth. Well, so th this, uh, the reason I spend so much time on this is the idea got loose in the 60s that LSD was a miracle drug and that it was all created within the context of 20th century history. This isn't what's going on. I mean, we, we are discovering uh, the chemical forces that created humanness in the first place, and then we're discovering the consequences of having disrupted those relationships. I think it would do a lot to change the, the discussion about drugs in this country if we had this kind of model of prehistory in front of us. Of course, it would enrage a great deal of people in the same way that the 19th century had to come to terms with the idea that we may be descended from apes. This theory would add the notion that we now have to face the fact that we're descended from stoned apes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one further uh, nail in the coffin of male pride. <laughs> <laughs> now all over the world you know not everybody fell into history only the white European type fell into history and then eventually managed to drag everybody else into it by making it a global phenomenon but even as we speak you know in the rainforests of the Amazon in the highlands of Mexico in in the you know even in the slums of Lagos and uh, in Zaire, in many places, a connection to the vegetable gnosis has been maintained by people whose societies didn't opt whole hog for the historical model, and I think that the the centerpiece of the archaic revival is going back and looking at shamanism, both ancient and modern, and trying to create a bridge back to some kind of wholeness. We are all, um, we're all mixed up, sick, damaged by this thing that happened in the past. Uh, you know, people used to say, well, the only people who need psychiatrists are people who are crazy. But the fact is, everybody is crazy because the cultural legacy of being now a thousand generations removed from anything authentic, you know, for most of us, uh, it, it's quite traumatic. And the dominator culture has fed upon itself and fed upon itself and now you know they can call the power that lights the stars down upon their enemies 
mean, this is like the final apotheosis of dominator values, that they have learned enough about the structure of matter and the dynamics of energy that they can call down the stars upon their enemies. Well, this is a very small and fragile planet in the face of that kind of energy. Uh, We could lose the whole thing. I mean, we could lose it spectacularly, or we could just toxify it out of existence. The, the only counterflow to that is some kind of reconnection with nature that is not casual, not weekend conservation. I heard Dave Brower, who some of you may know, who's the head of the Sierra Club, or was years ago till he got too nutty for them, uh, say... Uh, we need a jihad to save the earth. A jihad. A jihad is a holy war. It's where what you basically do is you tell people convert or die. You give them that choice. You say, we're going to do it this way, convert or die. He said, we need a jihad to save the earth because the situation is that desperate. Well, I'm not willing to call for a jihad because I think that in itself is a kind of dominator model. It's saying, you see, that it depends on us. Uh, I don't really believe that it depends on us except as we act to embody the collectivity. Uh, That's what I meant when I said last night that the major political task for people like ourselves is to be more stoned, you know, is to find out more about the dimensions of the psychedelic experience since we have apparently self-selected ourselves to be the experts on this because the experts are not the guys in the laboratories or the people looking at uh, uh, ESR output. It's the people who know what it is that are the experts. Well, that's the, I guess, every point of view has a myth. And so that's the myth of this point of view that anchors it to prehistory that says, you know, we are what we are because of these relationships to plants. We cannot go forward into who we want to be until we clear up our relationship to these plants. Uh, And then finally, you know, it's a political issue. In the same way uh, that uh, reproductive freedom is a political issue. I mean, ever since and before the signing of the Magna Carta, the main socio-political debate that has been waged in Western society is how free shall the individual be? And the thought has been pretty strongly planted that the individual should be as free as the individual can be without it dissolving the minimal social constraints to keep society together. And yet, you know, as recently as a hundred years ago, people were putting pants on piano legs because uh, the Victorian mind felt that the unclad piano leg might lead young men to acts of self-abuse. Well... um, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. But a truly, a truly creative young man, <laughs> a, a truly creative young man will then evolve a fetish to the pants of piano legs, <laughs> so that, so the party can go on. <laughs> Women were given the vote in 1920. Slaves were freed in this country less than 130 years ago, one of the last places to free slaves, by the way. And, uh, Would you say that again? I'm talking about about the, last that it, the United States was one of the last places to outlaw slavery. I mean, it had been anathema in Europe since 1820. Slavery is an interesting uh, thing because... Um, The Romans had slavery on a massive scale, and Roman society ran on slavery. Uh, And then when the Roman Empire fell, slavery fell into disrepute. 
if you had a slave in the Middle Ages, you had one slave. And it meant that you were some heavy honcho. I mean, it was the equivalent of owning a Rembrandt. A, a slave was a luxury item beyond all imagining. And uh, it pl slaves played no role in society whatsoever in the medieval period. It was all surf serfs, landed serfs, who could not be bought and sold. Only as the land was bought and sold could they be... And they couldn't be moved off the land either. It had no relationship to slavery. Well, so then if slavery died at the close of the Roman Empire, how come the whole history of the Enlightenment is the history of getting entangled with slavery? Well, the answer is, strangely enough, a drug. The reason that slavery was brought back after being for a thousand years in disgrace was for the production of sugar, for no other reason. Sugar is, at that time, was produced under conditions of about 130 degrees of temperature, these boiling vats and crystallizing processes. No one would, would work sugar unless they were shackled and under the lash. And sugar is absolutely unnecessary. It's a complete luxury. Nobody needs sugar at all. In the year 1800, every ton of sugar entering England was being produced by slave labor. So here was a situation. It began with the, the Portuguese. They, even before the discovery of America, they had islands in the East Atlantic, the island of Madeira, and they had sugar holdings there, but they produced very minimal amounts of sugar. And then, uh, in a confrontation at sea, they captured a bunch of Arabs, pirates, basically, and they were about to have these guys walk the plank when they said, listen, there are all these black people in the center of Africa who would make wonderful bonded labor. Instead of offing us, why don't you set us up and we'll uh, bring human beings out of the interior for the sugar industry? And this was done. And it became an overnight success. And the prices paid for sugar were so high that popes and kings were caught up in this corruption. It wasn't that people didn't think it was bad. It wasn't that people had never asked themselves these questions. Not at all. This had all been settled in 600 AD. It was that they were rapacious. It was the first time a single race has been singled out for servitude. One thing about Roman slavery, it was marvelously democratic. <laughs> you know, everybody was this, uh, potentially could be a slave. People talk about the scourge of cocaine. It's as to nothing what was done to the values of Western Europe in the pursuit of sugar. I mean, nobody is suggesting that we bring back slavery with the Pope's approval in order to produce more blow. But this was an entirely reasonable proposition to these entrepreneurial types in the 16th century. So it's just a little historical aside I have all this stuff at my fingertips because I've, the book that I'm writing for Bantam is called Plants, Drugs, and History. And I want to show that stemming from this breakdown uh, of the psychedelic relationship, then all the addictions and substance obsessions that come out of that are an effort to get back to this primal equilibrium. Well, now, I think I'll just stop there and hope that there are questions out of this, since this was a first thick hit of all this stuff. Yeah, I can. I missed the, uh, your comment on what the snake meant. Well, the, I, there was a kind of... It passed through my mind to talk about it. If you look at snake, the history of snakes in mythology, they almost always have good information about immortality. Snakes can be relied upon uh, for that. There's a very interesting myth. Some of you have heard me tell it. Uh, it's an old Minoan myth from the Cretan civilization that was the last outpost of this uh, uh, partnership thing. Um, 
some of you may remember Pasiphae because she was a really interesting figure in Greek mythology because she was so fascinated by the sexual energy of bulls that she had um, Daedalus, the same guy who would later attempt to fly home to the mainland. Uh, She had Daedalus construct an artificial cow that she could get inside of so that she could have sex with these bulls. And, you know, don't ask me what was going on, except that uh, these Cretan women are not to be messed with, obviously. (laughs) But there's there's an obscure myth that relates to her son that casts light on the Genesis myth. It's the myth of the story of Glaucus and Polyidos. Glaucus was uh, the son of King Minos and Queen Pasiphae, and when he was a young child, he was playing in the pantry of the palace one day, and he fell into a jar, a huge vat of honey. Well, now, you may or may not know that uh, across the Middle East, the dead were buried in these kinds of jars, and sometimes kings were buried in honey. But anyway, Glaucus, this little kid, he fell into this honey pot and drowned. And no one could find him. No one knew where he was. No one thought to look in this particular honey pot in the pantry. And the king and the queen were frantic. And they uh, went to their diviners. And they said, you know, help us find our son. And the diviners said, well, we can't find your son, but we know who can. And the king said, well, so who? He said, it will be the man who can compose the most apt simile regarding a three-colored cow in your herd. Now, what this means is not clear. Obviously, the story may be garbled at this point. But anyway, the man, a man of language was what they were saying, a man who can compose this simile. So then the king called everybody together and asked people to compose a simile on the three-colored cow. And lo and behold, this guy, Polyidos, which means man of many ideas. Polyidos produced a brilliant simile on the three-colored cow. And so the king said, this is great. You will be the person who can find my son. So Polyidos went into trance and saw young Glaucus pickled in the honey pot in the basement. So he said to the king and queen, well, I've located your son. You're not going to like this. He's dead. And they went and they got him and he was dead. And the king said, well, you are you seem to be the smartest guy around, Polyidos. Uh, you found the boy. I want you to bring him back to life. And Polyidos said, no way, that's not my, I'm not that kind of a magician. And the king waxed wroth, as kings do. And uh, put him in a, in a, imprisoned him with the body and said, you're not coming out until my son lives. So Polyidos was completely freaked out by this situation, didn't have a clue on what to do and was just basically wailing and tearing his hair in this cell and he noticed a snake come in, a little hole in the wall and he thought that the snake was going to do something to the corpse of the boy and that he would get into even worse trouble. So he took a stone and threw it at the snake and killed it. And it was lying there dead on the floor. Then he went back to freaking out about his predicament and uh, a while passed and another snake came. And the snake came and it took one look at the first snake And before Polyidos could make a move, it backed out and was gone. And some time passed, and the second snake came again. And this time it had uh, some leaves in its mouth. And it went over to the dead snake and did something, and the snake lived. And Polyidos rushed forward and seized a little fragment of the plant and saw what it was, rang his jailers and asked that quantities of this plant be brought. And with it, he revived Glaucus. Uh, 
and brought him back to life. And everybody was delighted, and Polyidos thought that now he would be allowed to go back to Syracuse, which was his home. And, uh, and the king said, no, you're too valuable a man to me. I can't let you go. I'll only let you go once you teach my son everything you know. So Polyido said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so he did. He settled down and he took on young Glaucus as his student and he taught him everything he knew. And then at years later, Glaucus is a young man. The king has given Polyidos permission to return to his homeland. They all walk down to the, the boat together. And at the very last moment, Polyido says to Glaucus, your old teacher has just one request of you. And he says, what is it? And he says, I want you to spit in my mouth. He says, okay. So he does, he spits in his mouth. And at that moment, all of the magical teaching and understanding returns to Polyidos and he walks up the gangplank and sails away. Now, this is an interesting myth for several reasons. Your question about Eden. Uh, you see, the snake knew the secret of immortality in both stories. The, the snake had information about the tree of life and the snake had information about the plant of immortality. What's interesting also about this story is Glaucus means blue-gray. And blue-gray is the color that psilocybin-containing mushrooms turn when bruised. And preserving mushrooms in honey was a well-known maneuver in those areas. So what this may be is a death and resurrection myth connected with the mushroom as both uh, the thing raised from the dead and the thing then which is somehow caught up in this heros gamos of, uh, of transformation. So that's the Eden angle on the snake. Yeah. Um, I... That's right. Um, he wrote a book called um, The Breakdown, is it called The Breakdown of Consciousness and the Bicameral Mind? This guy, Julian Jaynes, his idea was, and it's an interesting idea, the whole thing was somewhat frustrating because he wrote a very big book on the role of hallucinations in shaping culture. And aside from one piddling mention of mescaline, you would never know that there are plants which cause hallucination. But Jaynes wanted to say that until very recently, the mental life of human beings was very different than it is for us. He wanted to say that as recently as Homeric time, which is a thousand BC, people didn't have egos. Uh, people were sort of robot-like. And then if they got into a very tight spot and were about to be offed or something, a god would speak. It wouldn't appear, but this god would speak and tell them what to do. Say, like, get out of there. You know, do this, do that. And that this psychic function, previously perceived as the voice of God, eventually was integrated into the structure of the psyche and became the ego. Much in the same way that uh, the mitochondria of the cell of the animal cell were once free-swimming bacteria, you know, 300, 400 million years ago, and they became embedded and entangled in a larger cellular matrix. So James is trying to say that um, this godlike ego became incorporated as an ordinary psychic function. What caused this to happen was traders going from one widely separated human group to another would bring the news that God was not saying the same things in all places. <laughs> and this started philosophical disputation on its uh, noble road. And then people realized, well, if the gods aren't saying the same things, then it's not really God, and so then what is it? And slowly integrated it. I, I don't believe his theory. I like, I think it's a, it's a good theory for academia. Uh, 
it forces them to look at some of their premises a little more carefully. Uh, I don't think it's about opening a channel to the um, non-dominant sphere of the brain. I think that's a way of, of, it's a metaphor for this boundary dissolution. Maybe if you have an open channel to the non-dominant side of your brain, it's like a psychedelic experience. But I suspect that's too good to be true. And uh, and that probably uh, you need the psychedelic experience. But clearly we are cut off from something, either the other half of our brain or the vegetable matrix of life or something like that. We are cut off. I mean, history is a very unbalanced situation. That's why it's temporary, because it's a high state of disequilibrium. Major impact? I didn't quite get it. Well, sugar. I, I was talking, I mean, I consider sugar definitely a drug and uh, one of the most heavily addicted drugs on a world scale that there is. There have been numerous episodes over the past few hundred years. I mean, I maintain all culture is, is styles of relating to chemicals, you know. Alcohol culture, uh, the way in which it imprints early sexual experiences, that sort of thing. Uh, When Napoleon invaded Egypt, he took a huge number of scholars with him and everything from furniture styles to cuisine was imported back into France, and so was hashish. And hashish uh, and laudanum, tincture of opium, had a tremendous influence on the romantic imagination, both its fecundity and its morbidity. I mean, that's typical opium, reverie, all that stuff. So, you know... uh, Drugs are like cultural styles or languages. They're invisible to us. Very few people don't have drug dependencies. I mean, most of what life is, is regulating yourself through the waking part of the day, either making decisions to do or not do certain kinds of things. I mean, isn't that most people's story? I mean, I consider myself a moderate drug user, and I get up in the morning and then the first thing I do is I make tea. And that's a low hit of caffeine. That lasts until about 10.30. Then I get serious and make a huge pot of coffee. And then that allows me to work until like 2 in the afternoon. Then I have to have another cup of coffee, but with a J in order to be, you know, keep it going. And... Uh, you know, then there's sugar regulation on the side of this. And then when you add into it, you know, non-invasive drugs like television. I mean, tele- the average American watches four and a half hours of TV a day. Imagine if there was a drug that made that kind of claim on people's time. My God, we'd regard Western civilization as going to hell in a handbasket. But... Uh, you know, the drugs of the future are likely to be these non-invasive electronic drugs. I just finished writing an article on virtual reality for Magical Blend magazine. Do you all know what virtual reality is? Virtual reality is a technology being very, very rapidly perfected and brought to market where you put on a silk glove with sensors at every joint and you put on a hood with television screens very close to your eyes or fiber optic screens very close to your eyes and you're in a reality. You're in another world. It's a world that you can touch. You can feel. But it's a different kind of world than this world because in that world if you want to go somewhere, if I wanted to see the TV set over there, you point and it comes to you. You open your hand, it stops moving toward you. Close your hand into a fist, it rotates you 180 degrees in the phase space. It's called virtual reality. Oh, well, Mattel is uh, has already begun to market. You've probably seen ads for it and just closed your mind. The Glove of Power, have you seen these ads? <laughs> 
the glove of power. And that's just a Nintendo system. And what it does is it images the glove on the screen. You put on this glove. There's a glove on the screen. You wiggle your thumb. It wiggles. There's a lever on a machine in the game. You reach out and you pull it and the lever reacts. And this is with... This is with Cradola equipment. I mean, you can't... I couldn't believe the primitiveness of this scene. I felt like it was like a science fair project gone apeshit. <laughs> but they're, what they're talking about, you know, is very fast processing of images at extremely great depth. They're going to do this. The entertainment potential of it is clear. Uh, this has to do with the, some of the scenarios of the future that we'll talk about this afternoon because virtual reality is very important to creating a sane human future. No, that's something else. That's brain stimulation technology uh, to cause... Yeah, that's a different thing. I will talk about it a little... Uh, it's the idea that there are machines that can duplicate drug experiences or create equally interesting neurological experiences. And it's done with goggles, with flashing lights around the perimeter, and then a sound. By varying the frequency and amplitude of the flashing light as it beats against the incoming sound, you can create very interesting neurological states. They're not... Well, they are and they aren't like psychedelics. Nothing is very much like a really breakaway psychedelic experience. But it is interesting that with these machines, so much imagery and so much color can be coaxed out of these setups. Just a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I was at a place called in Berlin called Relax Berlin. And it was it's a place designed for yuppies on their... Uh, dinner, you know, office breaks to come and spend 40 minutes under these machines. And so far, I haven't seen any that have really impressed me. They all work much better if you smoke some dope, which probably is going to be the last word on them for a while. The, the virtual reality is much more, is much different. The virtual reality is not a neurological chaos, it's a programmed reality of some sort. I mean, the one I was in was, you know, so banal it brought tears to your eyes, but it, what it was was it was an office. It was a reception area. <laughs> a reception area, and then you walk through a door, and then there was a, a, a large desk with a telephone on it and a, uh, and a bookcase with a couple of books in it, but I discovered something immediately. I mean, it was not an intended discovery. I forgot that if you point at something, it moves toward you, or you appear to move away from it. And, uh, and I would just let my pointing hand drift downward. And when I would do that, I would burst through the ceiling of the office, and then if I didn't change my position, the office and the attached antechamber just were shrinking smaller and smaller in a kind of olive drab space that I was clearly, you know, flying into infinity and there was nothing else in this reality. Well, so then I did the fist thing. It turned me around 180 degrees and then I could get back down to the office hanging in this olive drab space. But... Uh, uh, it's a freaky technology because the human visual apparatus is unbelievably forgiving of error. In fact, the human visual apparatus is set up to suppress error. So even though you have this fairly Mickey Mouse technology, your eye and your brain are just working like dogs to make it all into a real world and to paper over all the weird stuff about it, you know. Well, so if the technology can come closer, the brain is waiting to fill in all the chinks and, and make it very nice. It's manufactured, it's just very costly. It's at the level now where the only reason you would buy one is if you wanted to uh, 
experiment with it. You were a company or so filthy rich that it just didn't matter. $50,000. Oh, it's coming down. The way they envision it, you see, what it requires is it requires very large and fast parallel processing computers. It is not something that's going to be standalone in the home. It's going to be sold over cable so that the really powerful computers to do this will be accessed over the phone lines. What the end consumer will have is simply the helmet and the glove, and then they want to do a full body stocking so that your whole body will be in there. And then they have the big research project they're working on now is called RT for Two, Reality for Two, and the and you can see the implications. <laughs> if you can get one other person in there with you, you can get everybody. It's if you can get one, you can have fifty thousand. Jared Lanier's thoughts on the matter. Yeah. Yes. Well, Gibson. In, who knew nothing about computers was the first person to come up with this concept. He called it cyberspace. He just thought that large, very large databases should be configured to be like physical objects so that you know your way around, so that you know you jack into cyberspace. This enormous red rectangle, the size of the Empire State Building, that is the Wells Fargo database. Further on down the boulevard, that turquoise trapezoid, that is uh, Defense Department data. And then on the other side of the street and two blocks over is the National Medical Index. In other words, he said these databases should be thought of as places and will create a world, a virtual world, where you travel from place to place to get data. You see, the interesting thing, if any of you are familiar with the Macintosh computer interface, what makes it so user-friendly is that it treats everything like ordinary objects so that as monkeys... We understand perfectly how to do this. I mean, when you're in a program like Full Paint and you want a paintbrush, you must go and get your paintbrush. And when you're done using it, you must put it back in your toolbox. Now, there is no toolbox and there is no paintbrush. They're virtual. But nevertheless, you treat them the same way you treat non-virtual objects, as they're coming to be called. This kind of equipment should not be in the hands of people. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, Tim Leary said years ago, LSD is a substance which can cause psychotic reactions in people who don't take it. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of psychosis caused by drugs that people didn't take. Uh, I mean... See, it's all the Western mind is so quirky. I mean, we would accept a machine, I think, the fact that television has gotten as far as it has with as little criticism. But if people were smoking pot four and a half hours a day, I mean, there'd be a national soul-searching uproar over it. So we just have certain biases and certain canalized ways of thinking that are easier for us to move down. The future isn't very comforting for that kind of know-nothingism because uh, electronic stimulation is very, very possible. And uh, the difference, you know, computers are becoming more like drugs. Drugs are becoming more like computers. The computers of the future will be taken orally and the drugs of the future will probably be jacked into So uh, getting hung up on the language of it, the important issue is the alteration of consciousness. What is it and what is it good for? What does it say about who we are? What can we do with it? The reason I see the people who've produced virtual reality, they have, they're, uh, the people who are in charge of trying to think of something neat to do with it, 
haven't gotten very far. I mean, of course it will make astonishing pornography possible. Of course, cleaning up radioactive waste spills will now be very easy. Uh, fixing space stations, if you happen to have one, will be less of a problem with virtual reality because you'll go in virtual reality outside, find the box, lift the lid, turn the screw. You'll do it ten times in virtual reality before you'll actually put on the suit and go out. But what I think virtual reality is good for is showing each other the insides of our minds that we are going to be able to create art like nothing that has ever been seen before. In fact, uh, one of the mavens of virtual reality, Eric Gullickson, has predicted that uh, most designing in the 21st century will be virtual design. I mean, when you think that, uh, you know, it costs nothing to design a Piranesi cathedral than it does to design a modest A-frame because the thing is going to be built of light. So everybody can live at Versailles if that level of ostentation is attractive to them. Uh, I think that I, I look forward to this. I want to take the architectural perspectives of Bibiana and walk through those, you know, mile-long cor colonnaded corridors with reflecting pools and all that sort of thing. Uh, and then, what interests me about virtual reality on another level is it goes back to the DMT experiences that we talked about earlier this morning that on DMT, there's the, the way in which these entities communicate is with a visible language, a language that's beheld rather than heard with the ears. Well, this is a higher signal. It's a better signal, less degradation of intentionality and a visibly beheld signal. You know, the old rap, a picture is worth a thousand words. So... Uh, I think we could create a new modality of communication in virtual reality modeled on the psychedelic experience. I mean, what would it be like to slave a voice synthesizer to a virtual reality with software instructions such that, for example, every time I use the connector and a trans a fluorescent turquoise polygon would become suspended in the air and every time i used a certain verb a different kind of topological manifold would be plugged in to the connector in other words if we changed the stuff of language into phys virtual tinker toys then we could use our voice to drive an assembly of visible objects in the virtual reality. Do you follow what I'm talking yes. about? Good. Well, it's noon, so <laughs> time for lunch. <laughs> we'll be back here at... Oh, no. Four. Four. Four to six.